Join us as we take you across cultures and continents exploring everything from frozen wilderness to steaming jungles in search of some of the greatest adventure fishing spots in the world. We will meet people who live to fish and people who fish to live. This is Wild Fish, Wild Places. I'm an adventurous angler and I've travelled to many parts of the world in search of wild fish in wild places. And it was on one such trip that I picked up Arctic Journal, a book by Burnwill Brown. Burnwill was born in Rochester, New York in 1920. At the age of 28, he became an Oblid missionary priest. And his first posting was to the Canadian High Arctic. For the next 23 years, his life was one full of adventure. He acted as a midwife. He was a medic. He was a spiritual leader to his people. He was a carpenter of the most fantastic and exquisite buildings that I've ever witnessed. He has built churches and mission buildings from hand cut and peeled spruce logs with the chinking between the boards. And these beautiful buildings are available to witness today. He has learned to mush dog teams down Arctic frozen rivers at temperatures as low as minus 60 centigrade. He has participated in canoe trips across Arctic Canada and he's represented Canada in many events throughout the world. Burnwell Brown is a unique and remarkable man by any stretch of the imagination. So when I sat down with my good friend Dennis Isbister and recounted the tale, we both decided, we've got to go there. We're going to go up and meet with Burnwell Brown and stay with the Hareskin Denny people. What we wanted to do above all else is to try and catch an Arctic lake trout of giant proportions from these cold, frigid waters, that is, Colva Lake. Colva Lake is a really unique place, lying about 50 miles inside the Arctic Circle in Arctic Canada, and is home to a traditional band called the Hareskin Dene people, numbering about 130, 140 people in total. Their life is a traditional one, eking out a living through harvesting musk ox and caribou and fish from the surrounding lakes and land. Fantastic day for us. Yeah. Dennis. Dennis, Dennis, nice yeah, you. Dennis. From uh, Nevada. That's right. You know what happened here? Uh, I had another pilot take off from Edmonton here an hour ago. He used this machine and he disconnected my wagon. Burn came up on the four wheeler and first thing off, he's talking about his, his uh, wagon that he lost. He didn't have a wagon, somebody didn't hook the wagon up, and the whole time, the wagon sitting behind the floor with <laughs> Dennis and I went over to Burns' house to meet his wife Margaret and we were brought into his study and I could see that this is where he probably did most of his writings and all around the walls of the study he had these wonderful paintings of scenes from Canada, from all the different postings he'd been in. And I realized quite quickly that from an early age, Byrne wanted to go to the Arctic. He wanted to be an Arctic adventurer. You painted that when you were 12. Yeah, and this one here, that is uh, 35, uh, 50, 50 and 14 years old. You did that when you were 15? Yeah. That is beautiful. 
and that one when I was 12. So just looking at these, I can see that you had it in your mind to oh. always be an adventurer up in the high art. Definitely. Another thing I got here, though, that may be of interest to somebody is a certificate that you've crossed the Arctic oh, yeah. Circle. <laughs> now, the government supplies those, and uh, I'm willing to write them for anybody here that I wants one. I would love it. Yeah. Huh? I would love it, witnessed by you. You want one? I do I indeed. I do indeed. That afternoon, he's telling us about the different places where he's caught big fish, and he's pointed out on that along this shore. It's as good as any place in the lake, right here. Don't go over here. It's all shallow and weedy over here. Especially here. This island here is called Duca. And these pictures of me fishing, I have my net set right here, right in between. Yeah, these are all old time pictures. That night, we go to bed, and the next morning, we're going to get up early and try some of these spots. The, the forecast last week was given for this week. It looked really good uh, for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Stable sunshine conditions, uh, high temperatures, you know, 22, 23 degrees. And now the nearer we got to the, to, to the actual date we're looking at of Tuesday, the 6th, you can see a change that was going to be cloudy with rain showers and sunshine with hot, stable weather conditions coming in around Thursday, Friday, Saturday, up to maybe 24 degrees centigrade. So it's a, it's a very elusive thing, it seems, up here, stable weather patterns. It seems to be changing. We've had almost three seasons in one day so far, in one morning, in fact. All we're missing now is snow. an old pattern, it was called a Dexter spoon, it's not available anymore, and uh, these are just copies that were made up for me, this guy made them off, and uh, it's a brown trout pattern, and it seems to work really well up here, in the territories, I suppose it mimics in a way a red fin or something like that, the pattern on. they're heavy, they weigh about probably two ounces, two and a half ounces, maybe three, You know, we're talking about the yeah. the old school way of the doing old, things. The old, old school. Their their whole view of fish is to live. Yeah. They're they're sustaining life in the Arctic North for nine months off of the fish that they they, they you know freeze. They feed to their their sled dog team. They live off. Of, they said their favorite their delicacy was fish head. Yeah, that's right. Their favorite part of the Boy, fish, fish of a head. trout is a fish head, and they'll hang it out and they'll dry it and then they'll also boil it he said if they if it's too nasty weather outside you know he, he's insistent that we kill every fish that we keep or kill every fish that we catch but you're right dennis it, it's a different mindset but of course we're sports fishermen we derive our pleasure in a perverse way from seeing these gorgeous fish and then returning them and other people it's a deadly serious life or death thing make sure they get enough food For, for people like Dennis and I, and other, all the other millions and millions of sport fishermen, we derive our pleasure from catching these lovely fish, gorgeous looking fish, and admiring them. And if they're really a trophy fish, we weigh them carefully in a sling, with a weighing scale, we measure them, photograph, return them. It's all done in about 30, 40 seconds. We're, we have all our equipment set up. But for the people like of Colville Lake, the community up here, this hair slavey band, it's, it's the opposite. It's a deadly, serious life and death game of trying to get food for the table, to feed the family, to feed the extended family, and I respect that. And uh, in a way, with this, I suppose, contradiction in terms of us coming here, spending money and time and effort and planning to get up here to this wild, wonderful place, this very remote, isolated community, and pursuing giant lake trout, because that's our thing. We're in pursuit of all different big fish, and the difficulty that that entails and track them down, locate them, and try and catch them. But for the people living here, it's totally different. They see the fish.
fish here as a source of life. And without that, as a source of protein and food, there's no life here. So we got up early, we headed out on the lake, we went to some of the spots that Byrne pointed out. We had minimal luck, we had a few fish, and then the weather closed in. So we headed back to see where Byrne wanted to take us the next day. Here's where I want to take you tomorrow with the loom going right up. See this stream here? See it there, yeah. This is Aubrey Lake right here. It's running out here. Good water flow. I'd like to have a crack at that. So Aubrey Lake feeds into Colville. Yes, it does. And then Colville goes north. Pretty nice weather day, a little bit of thunderstorms rolling in, but still beautiful. He's got a $60,000 Hughes Craft, double engine, two Yamaha 115s on the back, like a 24-foot deep V boat that he had brought in on, on the ice road for him. Hey, Byrne. Yeah. Where are, we where are we heading today? We're heading over to the Yamaha 15 miles. There is uh, I hear rumors of big fish in the area is what we hear, huh? Well, I just said a rumor there's a big one up there, yeah. That's one of the guys come back from fishing up there yesterday? Well, they were hunting up there, but uh, they weren't fishing. But they seen the fish in there. Like they were, uh, where were they at? In shallow? It's shallow all the way up there once you get in there, yeah. Yeah. So they, yeah. What? Yeah. What, what kind of depth are we looking at fishing, fishing wise? Once we get up in there, once we're fishing, oh, we're going to be fishing in a couple of feet of water. A couple of feet of water. Yeah, that's about all. That's where they're at. I got to have a man up on the front deck here looking for reefs. Okay. Boy, there's some bad ones out here. I don't want to hit one. No. Oh, man, it's devastating. I hit one here when I launched this boat, took both crops. So what we're doing now is we've got a bunch of shallow, rocky reefs coming out off this point. And if we hit one of these with this big motor, they shatter. It's devastating. We'll be out here bobbing around until somebody picks us up or we paddle in. So. A little deeper? Uh, no, no, a little bit maybe, not much. This is the name uh, Congarolini right here. Congar Con is the house. Congarlini. Congarlini. That's this place right here yeah. where uh, Chief oh. Louis Zone was camped here. Yeah. And, and who, who was Colville that the lake is named after? Colville's another guy from England that never saw Canada. <laughs> I'm going to have you looking close up here. And you can turn right then once you get out here. Yeah, so yeah, right, right. yeah, that's right. Yeah, McFarland, Roderick McFarland, he uh, made a trip right through here. So Byrne takes us to Aubrey Creek. He's telling us about the history of the lake and the settlers that came there, and he has no idea how to run this big expensive toy. He runs us up on a sandbar, alarms are going off in the boat, he can't see behind him to fix the problem, and he refuses any help that we have to offer. Bring it up? Yeah, bring it up. Okay. Bit more. More? Bit more, yeah. Okay, okay. So let's we go. finally get ourselves off the sandbar and we work our way up into the mouth of Aubrey Creek in search of the mythological school of lake trout that Byrne was heading towards. We've uh, we've made our way 15 miles across Colville Lake from the from the community. We're, we're easing up here into Aubrey Creek. The Aubrey Lake runs into Colville Lake, and right here you can see the mouth of Aubrey Creek, and we have a big shallow, muddy flat out ahead of it. We've got both motors up as far as they'll go, and we're working our way in here. There's supposed to be some big lake trout up in, up in this creek here, so we're gonna go explore and see what we can find. We'll try a little casting right here. Everybody got their pole. <laughs> wow. I think the big trout would be in here eating the white fish. 
I can see some whitefish eating bugs back. moved up here into Aubrey Creek uh, about a half a mile or so it's shallow it's running good beautiful beautiful water uh, there's pretty much nothing left in here but whitefish we saw one pike what it looks like what it looks like is going on here is we it's the water temperature has all been raised too much it's 60 degree water temperature and the uh, the big game fish have all vacated this these areas this is the kind of stuff you see them in two weeks after from ice out for two weeks they use these areas to spawn. They stay adjacent to the, to the mouth of these rivers. And then as it warms up 60 degrees, they're out 15 feet of water. They're just not here. Uh, it looks like all the whitefish are bunched up in here, eating bugs, everything. But that's all, that's pretty much all we can see in here right now. We have to go, go back out in the main lake and look for some big lakers. Oh, I'm disappointed up here. Uh, we've come up here and and uh, stopped where I turned around right there, and we catch uh, 50 trout right there. Well, I'll say one thing. You guys haven't got cowbells, but I got a set in one of my tackle boxes here. So I want somebody to use it. We'll get into deep water here pretty soon. Uh, we come out of the mouth of, of Aubrey Creek and, and came down the shore about 10 miles and we're in somewhere around 15 to 20 feet. We're not quite sure. Burns said this is the big fish hole and we're going to just drop them out and see what happens. Hopefully we get lucky. We got to, with the slowest we can get this boat down, it looks like it's about three and a half miles an hour. Yeah. So I'm using, I'm using the big Dexter spoon with two ounces of lead on, on, on line on it. I'm going to put the swim bait out. Oh, here we go. We're going to just try to get well, something. It's only a 4.1 miles an hour. All right. So, we're Just the weight situation. It's got to be 8, 10 feet deep, huh, Alan? Try and make a drogue, a, a homemade to... drogue. Slow down the, the rate at which we're driving forward. Too fast for fishing effectively. What we intend doing is just tying off, and this will slow us down. When the, when the boat's going so fast, the lures often kite off out of rhythm and out of sync, and they're not working effectively. So you're trying to get the boat to operate at the maximum capability to suit the lures. That's why we're trying to slow it down. Oh, we're at three right now. It's a little better. 2.83 is good. I can make that work. Yeah, buddy. Two eight. <laughs> what we're doing here with these lures is we're popping them forward and dropping them back like they're wounded bait fish. The, uh, these trout will get in behind and they'll follow. They'll follow it for a long time until it does something different. And what we're trying to imitate here is a wounded bait fish that they're attacking. So the whole time you're trolling for trout, you want to be speeding it up, slowing it down, speeding it up, slowing it down. And most of the time, they'll hit it on the drop. They drop it back, they grab it, and then the fight's on. So we come out of Aubrey Creek, moving out to deep water, and we end up catching one fish. Today we've been driven up on a sandbar, taken to a creek where there's no fish. We can't seem to get into any kind of deep water and we can't slow the boat down. Fishing with burn is certainly an adventure. The afternoon is a complete disaster. So we head back in, we get to the dock, and out of nowhere, the weather closes in. 
We don't know if we're going to be able to complete our mission with this weather coming in, and we've got to find somebody who really knows this lake. On the next episode of Wild Fish, Wild Places, I go off and meet with Chief Richard Goshaw. He's the chief of the Cove Lake community. He's invited Dennis and I to go out on a netting campaign, and he wishes to show us where these lake trout are staging. He's also invited us to share in a fantastic banquet that he's prepared of lake trout, and whitefish particularly, from this gorgeous lake. He brings out these two partially frozen, gutted, but still blood and the mucus in the head. I said, listen, Alan, if you don't eat this fish, you're gonna insult the chief, and we're not getting anywhere else with him. <laughs>